Hello everybody, it's Mrs. Pound and I am back with your the very last section in our chapter on earthquakes. So this section is on prediction and effects and it's found in section 325 in your books. Our objectives today are to relate various side effects of earthquakes, interpret clues that suggest an earthquake may be about to occur, and to summarize ways to reduce damage caused by earthquakes. So with an earthquake, earthquakes themselves can be very damaging, but a lot of times too there are aftershocks that take place, and aftershocks are a tremor that follows a large earthquake. Sometimes the aftershocks can be just as damaging or more damaging than the earthquake, even though they are not as high of a magnitude, because you already have weakened buildings, and so even a small aftershock can cause more damage to those weakened structures. They occur as a result of a fault continuing to release stress or trying to readjust to its position. And they can be experienced at the epicenter for hours, days, or even weeks after an earthquake. So it can be over an extended period of time. Sometimes with earthquakes, you also get what's called a fissure. This is a tear in the crust caused by the friction of a fault. And they will go all in often different directions. They're like wrinkles. And actually in the Bible, there is an account of a fissure in Deuteronomy when there were some people who rebelled against the Lord and he opened up the earth and it swallowed them. So that is an example of a fissure in the Bible. Another thing that can happen with earthquakes is called liquefaction. This is the process by which soil loses strength and acts as a liquid instead of a solid. So it starts to move like a liquid, kind of like when you have a bunch of marbles in a container. They flow somewhat like a liquid, even though they are solids. Liquefaction is caused by the energy of seismic waves increases the water pressure. This increased water pressure breaks the bonds between soil grains and suspends them in the water. The soil behaves like water when enough soil grains are suspended, so then it will be able to behave like a liquid and move like a liquid. Now, it can cause things called sand boils, which are the picture in the background here, landslides, tilt or collapse of ground that was once flat. So it can cause some pretty catastrophic things. And here, the pressure becomes so great underneath the sand that it pushes the water up and out. And it looks like little, sometimes these are also called sand volcanoes because it looks like little sand volcanoes. Now, we all have heard a lot about tsunamis, and these are a very large ocean wave caused by an underwater earthquake or volcanic eruption, and here we see a tsunami wave coming at us. These can be as high as 30 meters tall at times, and they are caused by a sudden movement of the ocean floor, and here we see that wave came through, um, and Look at all the debris everywhere here. They can be 30 meters tall and they go inland quite a ways too because when you are close to the ocean, um, the land is relatively flat and so a wave that tall can travel a great distance. In fact, uh, a wave that is 10 meters tall in Japan went 10 kilometers inland with its destruction. So they can go quite a ways. Now, tsunami waves grow to great heights as they near shore because the bottom of the wave slows down due to the friction as it enters shallow water. So we see a tsunami wave coming at us here in the background. There's that wave. Notice how flat the ocean is behind it. Now, tsunami waves on the ocean, you wouldn't even notice them really. In fact, you might know a tsunami is going on if the ocean is too calm because in the ocean, a tsunami wave has a very long wavelength, perhaps even hundreds of kilometers long. That's the distance between each crest of a wave. 
They travel at speeds of 800 kilometers per hour, perhaps. And the crest height might only be one meter tall. So you would not necessarily notice this out on the ocean. It's when they get to shallow water, the wave fronts get slowed down, they bunch together, and they produce this huge wave coming in that can be 10 meters to 30 meters tall and go really far inland. Now, some factors that indicate greater probability for an earthquake. So we've looked at some of the effects, but let's see, can we actually predict these things? Well, one thing we look at is seismic gap. Seismic gap is the time between earthquakes. The longer a gap between earthquakes, the more likely you are to have an earthquake and the higher magnitude it's likely to be. Increased radon gas emission. Radon gas is due to the breakdown of uranium uh, under the crust, and there's an increase of this emission when there are new cracks in the crust. So when new cracks are produced, when a lot of stress is built up, this can be a clue that there's going to be an earthquake coming up because of these new cracks. Also, sudden lowering of the water table. If there's more cracks in the crust due to a possible impending earthquake, water has more places to go under the crust as well, and it will seep into the crust in these cracks and lower the water table. Expansion in the Earth's crust. You, there might be bulges that are starting to occur, and this can be measured with satellites. And also cessation of fault creep, again, monitored with satellites, as we talked about this before, that if you have fault creep, that's actually a good sign because the crust is moving, it's not getting hung up anywhere. But if all of a sudden that fault creep stops, you're getting added pressure built up because we know that the crust is always moving and that's a sign of a possible earthquake coming. So precautions that can be taken against earthquakes. We can construct bridges and buildings that move with the earth. That's what they do in California. They do a lot of this in Japan where there are uh, buildings that are constructed and bridges constructed especially to move with the earthquakes. We can install automatic switches to shut off electricity and gas lines when tremors are first detected because that will reduce the amount of fires from gas being leaking and then possibly being ignited and from electrical lines coming down and causing hazards. And we can also establish tsunami warning systems along coastlines. You see here, there are even tsunami evacuation routes telling you where to go. They have developed a lot of these in especially Japan, uh, in that area in the Pacific, that warns you. Even a few minutes warning can be very helpful to get to higher land when a tsunami may take place. So our objectives were to relate various side effects of earthquakes, interpret clues that suggest an earthquake may be about to occur, and summarize ways to reduce damage caused by earthquakes. Don't forget your five questions, and you can start studying for that upcoming test because we have covered all of the material you need to know. And I will be back with another chapter. Our next chapter is on volcanoes, which are very closely related to earthquakes.